All right, we'll get started, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Today we have Zixin Huang from Macquarie University joining us. Uh, she has a long history of working in interferometric stuff and metrology, uh, primarily with Peter Koch in the UK, where she recently had a postdoctoral position, also did a lot of work with uh, John Dowling when he was still with us, and is now an SQA fellow at the Macquarie uh, node. And today she's going to be talking about some of her recent work on sub-wavelength quantum imaging for astronomy and LIDAR detection. Thank you, Zixin. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, yeah, um, so I'll be, today I'll be telling you about some of the work that I did in the last one and a half, two years ago related to quantum imaging. And these are done primarily in um, in collaboration with Peter Koch and Cosmo Lupo, both at Sheffield. So I think Cosmo has recently acquired a teaching position somewhere in Italy as well. Um, okay, so this is the outline for where we're headed. Uh, firstly, um, I will talk about how Rayleigh's criterion, or as Manke Zhang and collaborators termed uh, Rayleigh's curse, can be surpassed. And then I'll talk about how some of these techniques can apply to um, quantum LIDARs. So both of these are two source problems. And then I'll talk about how we can generalize to an end source problem. And I'll talk about something um, slightly different um, at the end. So this is um, about using um, quantum hypothesis testing task for exoplanet detections. Um, so these all fall under the general category of um, super, resolu super resolution imaging via metrology and well, the last one is for hypothesis testing. Um, hypothesis testing. So let's briefly go over the Rayleigh criterion. So if you take a picture of a point source in the distance, Due to the fact that your aperture or um, camera or lens has a finite extent, what you get on your image screen is not a point source, but it will have a finite spread. And so from Astronomy 101, we know that if you have a circular aperture, then the spread uh, takes the form of an airy function or airy disk. And two point sources are considered resolved if the maximum of one peak is further away than, um, the, than the minimum of the other. So for, from A there, the, the two point sources are considered resolved. From B there, they're still kind of resolved. And at, as they get closer and closer, they merge into a blob. And traditionally, we, uh, the minimum resolve, resolvable angular separation of two point sources is approximately proportional to lambda, which is the wavelength divided by d, which is the di diameter of the lens, your aperture. Okay, so now if the task is to estimate the parameter theta, theta two in, in this notation here, which is a separation between these two tasks, then we can imagine that this, bec this task becomes increasingly difficult when theta two becomes too, uh, becomes small. So, yeah, so we can have, let's say, so we approximate the point spread function by a Gaussian here, which is um, uh, fairly valid for, for an area function. And now I will quantify the statement you know, that the, the task becomes increasingly difficult. So the tools we're gonna use here is uh, quantum metrology. So um, we define the mean square error, well, or here the variance of the parameter um, um, in the usual statistical sense. So this is the, um, how well, like, so the precision that you can measure the parameter to is larger, is um, lower bounded by one over the new, which is a number of, of copies of the state that you can use. So here's the number of photons that you receive multiplied by the Fisher information. And the Fisher information is defined by um, this term over here, which is the derivative of the log. So if you have um, 
a set of events with probability, um, sorry, a set of events with um, outcome i, where the, where the probability of occurring is p of i, then the phase transformation of the parameter is given by the derivative of the log of p of i squared with respect to the parameter that you want, weighted by the probability of them occurring. So um, for any particular measurement, you want this Fisher information to be large to achieve a small variance for the parameter of interest. And of course, when you have a quantum state, you replace um, a, probability, a probability distribution by a quantum state, and the analogous quantity is the quantum Fisher information given by this expression over here. So the quantum Fisher information is just a Fisher information maximized over all the possible measurements. So is there any questions on this part so far? Just an intuitive question. I mean, uh, that, that Fisher information is a similar structure to a normal sort of Shannon or von Neumann information, yes. but it's got the derivative there, the second derivative or the derivative squared. What, what's the intuitive reason for the derivative in there? Um, so the derivative there is so, okay, so um, if you, so the intuition for using a, a log for the, for the probability is that um, it's a measure of surprise, right? So the more surprised you are that something happens, the more information you gain of the event. So the derivative um, measures how, um, how sensitive the distribution changes with respect to the change of the parameter. Wait, that's too long a sentence. Um, so it measures how, um, how much the distribution changes um, depending on the parameter. Um, so if your probability distribution changes a lot when your parameter changes, that's gonna, be, that's gonna give you a bigger official information. So for example, for phase estimation, we have something that oscillates like a sinusoid. Whereas for example, when you have a noon state, the sinusoid oscillates n times as fast. So, um, so, that, so the second one will have a larger well, Fisher and quantum Fisher information when you measure it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's fine, thanks. Cool. Okay, now let's come back to our two source problem. Um, so we describe the state like this. So we have psi one, which is describing a photon that's coming from the first source. So for example, that could be the, the darker blue curve here. And psi two is a photon coming from the second source. We assume that these two sources are um, equal brightness for all intents and purposes. So now if we calculate the Fisher information with respect to measuring the photon distribution on the screen, then we see that it drops to zero as the separation becomes close. So this parameter here is theta on sigma, where sigma measures the spread of your point threat function. So this is just this, this just measures um, how uh, so so this will be the standard variance um, of the of the Gaussian distribution. On the other hand, if we compute the quantum Fisher information then this parameter stays constant all the way up until um, almost zero separation. So this is telling us that there is actually information embedded in that state, which is not extracted by direct imaging. So that is to say that performing photon counting on the image screen is not the optimal uh, measurement for this particular problem. So what does that mean? Is that, is that saying the best thing to do is not to just simply measure the separation between these two peaks after you've you know, collected your photon on CCD screen, for example. Okay, but whereas uh, this parameter is extractable with a suitable quantum technique. What is that technique? Um, so uh, Zhang collaborators worked out that um, something like this will do the trick. So you have your uh, centroid of the two point sources. You have a multimode waveguide which has these natural Hermit Gaussian modes. And so you will align the centroid with this waveguide. And depending on the separation, um, so if the separation is very small, then the the photon will primarily couple into the fundamental mode, which only has uh, one one peak, 
if the photon starts having bigger and bigger separations, they'll couple into these higher model modes, higher order modes. And when you perform the mode sorting, so in principle, these modes are all distinguishable. So if we perform photon counting after we separate them, then this optimal measurement has a Fisher information that is equal to the quantum Fisher information. Uh, but in principle, this um, imp the implementing this is non-trivial. So that's one optimal measurement. Okay, so since uh, this paper was published in 2016, there has been um, an array of papers which studies the, um, the two source problem and it indeed has been studied to death at least by the quantum community. So here are just um, examples of recent PRL which came out of it. And so we thought, you know, what else can we do with it given that we have this nice set of tools that, ha that has this um, pulse shape. So, so we said, okay, um, so one obvious example would be for a quantum uh, LIDAR apl application. Well, so, um, so when you have Gaussian pulses, um, this is very natural for, this, uh, for, a, for a LIDAR ranging and velocity estimation uh, task. So for this here, because LIDARs are bandwidth limited, we will expect the, something equivalent to uh, Rayleigh's curves coming in. So when you have two targets which are closely separated and that they're within the bandwidth of the, of the LIDAR, then you will expect that if you're trying to estimate the separation, a similar curve would come in if you just perform uh, photon counting in the time domain. Something that's slightly different here is that we, also, we may also have control over the state preparation. So what, what, what I mean by that is that when you look at light source from a distant star, um, you get the light source and you try to perform the best measurement and that's it, right? But um, in, in this problem over here, we also have the option to choose what state to use um, for, this, for this probing problem. Okay, so we're gonna look at estimating the centroid of uh, a pair of targets as well as the separation and we want to estimate the absolute velocity of the centroid of a pair of targets or one target um, as well as the separation. So, uh, so let's look at a single target first. Uh, so the standard technique to resolve a target's range and velocity is to send electromagnetic magnetic pulses, yeah, electromagnetic pulses into the region of interest and look at the back reflected signal. So for, if you want to estimate the range, for example, that, that would be given by um, the time of arrival of the pulse or how much time, how much time delay there is between your initial uh, pulse and when it comes back. And the velocity of the target will be given by the Doppler shift. Now, the time energy uncertainty relation or the Arthur Carey relation states that the uh, time duration and bandwidth product, of which di dictates the maximum precision you can have on, on these two parameters, is, um, is lower bounded by a half. So, with any physical pulse shape, uh, a, a pulse that is fuzzy in frequency, or sorry, a shape a sharp in frequency would necessarily be fuzzy in in time and vice versa. So this is, I guess, related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So that is, you can't measure these two parameters simultaneously with arbitrary pre precision. And we can see that how, um, and yeah, we, we will see that how entanglement can uh, potentially break this. So uh, we will consider using entanglement and the um, state description is given by uh, something like this over here. Okay, so the only part that is important here um, is that um, we'll, we will look at preparing something that, that is also Gaussian in shape. So there's actually, uh, this, there's actually nothing too uh, mysterious about this wave function. So 
this is this is something that could potentially be prepared by uh, SPDC, for example, so a spontaneous parametric down conversion. So it has. So this just means that if you prepare um, two photons, um, you have a signal and the idler, and these two are correlated in time and frequency. So if you look at the the joints dense, uh, joint spectral density, it will look something like this. Um, so the parameter that is of interest is kappa over here, um, which describes the degree of correlation between them. So if kappa is zero, the two photons are completely separable, and so there is no correlation between them. And if kappa is one, uh, this scenario is actually unphysical, but kappa, we can make it as close to one as possible. So when it's close to one, um, the two have perfect, or almost perfect um, time, uh, time frequency correlation. Okay, so if you want to talk about performing joint estimation of two parameters, then the quantity of interest is the quantum Fisher information matrix. And when you have multiple parameters, um, the quantum Fisher information looks like this. So rho is your of the state that encodes the parameter. And L, um, L is, um, is the symmetric logarithmic derivative of that particular parameter, which depends on, um, which, which looks like this expression over here, where EM and EN are the eigen vectors that diagonalizes the, di the density matrix. So this is um, all in the standard toolbox. So now we will compute this parameter for, uh, let's look at the centroids for a target first. So if we are looking at the um, time and frequency of the, the target, then the quantum Fisher information matrix takes this form over here, where once again, so sigma omega is the bandwidth and frequency. So if we choose a, um, so for the time parameter, we can see that the um, higher the bandwidth in, in, in frequency, the, the sharper you can measure something in time, and of course, vice versa. So if something is wide in frequency, then the quantum Fisher information for frequency drops. And so for a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian pulse shape, um, the, dime, the, the duration bandwidth product is equal to a half. So, and this is the minimum you can do with separable photons. On the other hand, if you use uh, entangled states, so you do, you do state preparation and you send, send out, for example, the signal photon, and you keep the idle photon and you do a joint measurement, then the quantum Fisher information matrix picks up a factor of one minus kappa squared on the bottom for the frequency. So now when we look at this product, there's an additional one minus kappa squared um, appearing here. So it, this is saying that this, potential, uh, this product can potentially be less than a half. So we have violated the um, Arthur Kelly's relation. But um, unfortunately for these two parameters as, um, as, well, as well known, um, there is this joint optimal estimation condition that is not satisfied. So the trace of these two LS, uh, SLDs is not zero. So these two parameters, we can't measure them jointly optimally. And now we want to, uh, let's look at the position and velocity separation of these two, of these two scenarios. So similarly, as we've seen before, we have uh, perhaps a time profile that looks like this. So this would be um, that they, are, they have slightly different spatial separations. And then the two targets may have a slightly different velocity separation. So they're tra tra uh, traveling at slightly different speeds. Um, so once again, we can calculate the um, position of velocity separation uh, estimation quantum Fisher into matrix. Uh, so um, the only thing to note here is that there is a similar factor of one minus kappa squared appearing on the denominator um, for the frequency term. 
So this is a sim an analogous quantitative gain in the presence of entanglement. So there is a difference, however, in terms of um, the estimators. So the SLDs actually commute in the limit of uh, small separations for, for time and frequency. So in the limit that both of these parameters are small, um, this commutation relation becomes zero, which, which kind of suggests that you can actually measure these two uh, quantities simultaneously. Um, so this is one particular optimal measurement for the, the delta t parameter when the, the frequency separation is zero. So you will take your pulse, you will spread it into a spectrum, and then assuming that the centroid frequency is known, you take frequencies which are equal distance from the centroid, and then you interfere them at this is this entire um, bit at the end, the, the phase shift and the electro optic modulator stack is just a, a, a frequency Hadamard. So when you perform this measurement, this is optimal for measuring the separation um, for the two targets. And then at the end, you perform photon counting. Um, yeah, so for, for this part of the results, we've presented at the ultimate precision of a, a late of a quantum radar system, um, given entanglement or not. We considered a single as well as a pair of targets and that we show that the trade-off between time and frequency um, can be weakened in the presence of entanglement. So, so any questions for this part? Okay. So now, given that we know that the two source problem has been studied to death, what can we do? So the natural thing to do would be to generalize this to n sources. So we have this kind of scenario here where we have um, n amateurs. Uh, so this could be um, an array of satellites, drones, stars, if you want to do fundamental science. And on our side, we have um, an array of collectors. So these are just, for example, lenses, focusing lenses. And R here is um, linear optical unitaries. So let's first describe our system. So we have NS incoherent sources. We assume them to be monochromatic, and these are positioned at coordinate RS. We have NC collectors, and these are positioned at omega j. So if a photon arrives on, um, on the j collector, we call this, what well, we don't know, we, we denote this ket j. So for a single source, the quantum state is described by this thing over here. So we assume that the collectors are the same size, so which means that you have this um, normalization constant over here. Um, and the state um, arrives at the different collectors coherently with phase factors, um, which is dictated by the geometry between the source and the collector. So these are just given by the optical path differences from the source to the different collectors. And the quantum state that we received, that, that we receive on the, on the plane is given by the summation over the different sources weighted by their brightness. So PS is the um, is normalized brightness of the source. So, so the goal here is, to, um, keep in mind the goal here is to do a, um, quantum metrology task on, on the um, separation or, or some sort of coordinate on, on the source system. So we can denote the coordinate of sources by a um, 3NS component vector. So, so these are simply the coordinates of the sources. And now we can denote a unit vector, another unit vector with 3NS components, A, and in generalized coordinate theta, which is the dot product between um, A and R. So um, intuitively, we're using the we're using the vector A to pick out the components of R that we want to estimate. So for example, this could be a separation parameter between two or more sources. This could be a centroid. This could be a separation in the longitudinal direction between the sources. Right, so we want to compute the quantum Fisher information associated with, associated with the parameter theta 
So turns out that this is a particularly difficult task, even if you just have um, you know, two sources and more than two uh, collectors. Uh, so yeah, so the brute force method of computing uh, the quantification information here does not work. But what we have up, up our trick, uh, a trick that we have up our sleeve is purification. So we can purify the density matrix of the, of the photonic state so, so we can. So now we can actually use a um, alternative definition of the quantification information that is um, given by the fidelity between two states. So, F here is the fidelity between um, the state and the state with um, a slightly displaced um, parameter uh, state with respect to the parameter. So when we use this definition over here, um, after a couple of pages of proof, we see that the quantum fish information for the parameter theta actually reduces down to a matrix norm calculation. So the matrix norm here would just depend on um, the, the relative brightness of the sources as well as the optical path. So this becomes a much more tractable path. Um, and next, we also show that the quantum fissure information for theta can be achieved with linear, op uh, well, linear optics plus photon counting. So just a reminder again that a single source uh, takes this form over here. So, um, so to give you an, an intuition on, on why this works, or the, the, um, the intuition behind why super resolution works, so yeah, so let's have a look at um, this state a bit more carefully. So since um, we've now purified our state, we can pull out the unitary that is the, um, that generates the translation of the state with respect to these um, coordinates. And so in, in 3D, this might look like x, y, and z, and g, x, g, y, g, z are the generators. Um, and it turns out that the generators are proportional to the position of the collectors. And now, for those of you who, are, who may be familiar with quantum metrology, um, we know that the precision of a param particular parameter is proportional to the variance of the generator, which is to say that, say, for example, we have um, this configuration over here. If we want to estimate um, delta x, um, then um, then the precision of that parameter would be proportional to the generator of x, which is, in our case over here, is proportional to the spatial separation of these two collectors. So I, as in the distance between u1 and u2 over here. So this is just a slightly annoying way of saying that the precision of the parameter is dictated by the baseline of your collect collection system or your base um, or the baseline of the deformity. So yeah, so the precision is characterized. Blah blah blah. So that's why we strive to build um, larger telescopes, and this will give you higher res resolutions in terms of imaging. Uh, so yeah. So is there any questions for this part of the talk? So if not, then I'll just carry on. Okay, so I want to um, switch here slightly and talk about um, quantum exoplanet detection. This is actually somewhat of a clickbait title. Um, so, for exoplanet detection, we, um, various methods um, have, been, have been developed. So, for example, Yeah, it's okay. So the very common ones are radio velocity. So here you're looking at the uh, response of the star, uh, the, wait, the reflux motion of the stars in response to, of the star in response to um, in response to having um, a planet that's orbiting it. So here there's a shift in um, the spectrum. Uh, the, the spectrum of the star because it's moving. So you will detect a, a Doppler, um, a periodic Doppler shift 
depending on whether the star is um, traveling towards or away from you. There is the transit method. So here, um, there will be an exoplanet that's, com that's coming in front of the star and it will, it will resu uh, result in uh, a temporal dip in the intensity of the star. Um, there is gravitational microlensing uh, and various others, but these two pr uh, primary ones are more sensitive to stars which, are, uh, which have a, a planet which is closer to the star. So, yeah, so this plots actually the mass of the, of the planet that's found and the period of the, um, of the orbit. On the other hand, direct imaging traditionally has been more sensitive to planets that, which are further away from the star. And that's pre uh, precisely due to the Rayleigh criterion that we've spoken before. It's because when the star gets very close to the planet, then the problem is that you have a very bright object next to a very dim object. Um, and the problem of detecting whether the star there becomes difficult. And I will quantify this in just a moment. Yeah, so now if the, if, if the question that we ask is whether there is a planet there or not, this becomes a quantum hypothesis testing task. So we have two hypotheses, um, HA and HB. So this will actually correspond to two quantum states in, in, in the quantum regime. And classically, we have two classical probability distributions. So we're trying to distinguish between these two, two scenarios here, where you have a single star, or whether you have a secondary planet. So here we're actually going to, so we're going to denote the total uh, mean photon number from the system to be NS. So we're going to propose, um, we're going to preserve the total photon number here because uh, for argument's sake, let's say we don't know exactly what NS here, um, is here. So obviously, if there is a, um, so if you say that, that the, the star has a fixed brightness, then having a, a fixed planet will give you a little bit more energy. So we want to distinguish between these two scenarios here. Um, so for quantum state discrimination, there are two fundamental results. We have the symmetric case. So this, uh, for the symmetric case, we are, uh, so the, the two types of errors, so false positive and false negative, are weighted equally. So here, the quantity of interest is the quantum Chernoff bound, um, and the uh, error exponent is given by the, um, the trace distance, or the quantum trace distance in the quantum scenario. Mm -hmm. But so here, the, the two types of errors are weighted equally, and um, So, but perhaps like this may not be the scenario that you want. So for example, you might want to look at the asymmetric case where um, one type of error is weighted more against the other. So, for, um, so one clickbait example I always give is that for example, for COVID testing, you might be willing to accept a certain, a higher error for false positive where you want to tell someone who's innocent to stay home um, um, more than having somebody who's sick roaming around a community. So because exoplanets are rare, this might actually be the more interesting scenario because um, given that they're rare, you don't want to mistake it for, the, for being absent. So the quantitative question that we, want, that, that we can answer here is that um, given that a star is present, sorry, given that a planet is present, how do we minimize the probability of mistaking for the vacuum? And that um, is given by the quantum Stein lemma, where we have um, a probability of error um, is given by this expression over here, where n is the number of um, photons that you receive, S is the relative quantum entropy, and there are some terms which are logarithmic in epsilon, which is the error if which you're willing to accept, and there are terms which are log in n. So the quantum relative entropy is given by this expression over here, 
So we have, when you have two quantum states, you, um, this quantity can be computed relatively easily for our case. And of course, um, the classical analog will just apply to the classical probability distributions. Okay, so now we can go ahead and compute the on-screen probability distribution um, for these two scenarios. So the classical relative entropy, um, so, okay, so the, let's denote the angular separation of the planet star system by S. And epsilon is a relative brightness. So epsilon is how much um, intensity the planet has. So we see that the classical relative entropy is given by S squared and epsilon squared. So since this quantity is, sits inside an exponential and it has a negative sign in front of it, we actually want this term to be as um, large as possible. Um, so the fact that S is small and epsilon is small in our case, um, quantifies why um, it's so difficult to see a dim object next to a bright object. That is, um, this quantity is very small here. Now we can go ahead and compute the quantum case. So um, I'll keep these two expressions on the slide here. So comparing between these two, there is actually a factor of um, epsilon between the classical and quantum case, which is saying that we gain a factor of one on epsilon for the quantum. So if we plot these two quantities as a function of epsilon, we see that the classical, um, classical quantity is much lower than the quantum case. And if we plot it as a function of the separation, once again, there's a huge separation between these quantities. And epsilon um, for any usual exoplanet is tends to be at most a few percent. So um, so this is a significant gain. And when I talk to some of my astro um, collaborators, they're, um, they're very excited about it. And um, so of course you won't believe me until I show you that there's a physical measurement which can achieve this. And once again, um, the scheme that we've seen previously um, is almost optimal. So here we will align the centroid of the system into um, the centroid of this spatial demultiplexing um, device. So yeah, so in conclusion, we've computed the type two error probability exponent for discriminating between whether there's one or two sources present. And this actually works for arbitrary relative intensity. And we discovered that in the limit that epsilon is much smaller than one, then the quantum relative entropy is larger than direct imaging by a factor um, of one over epsilon. And uh, this paper should come out um, the, protector, the, the publisher keeps promising me that it comes out soon, but we'll see when it actually comes out. So, so in the future, I want to look at um, using multiple telescope sites, which are separated by a large distance, and how we can use entanglement distribution um, in combination with memories and quantum correction codes to help combat losses and decoherence and see if we can um, push this kind of scheme um, into the optical regime where, so currently, all of these large ASAN telescopes op operate in the microwave or radio because we can measure the field directly. So we can't do this in optics anymore. And we want to see how we can, um, how we can use um, quantum techniques to push this into the optical. Yeah, so we have um, collaborators at, at Bristol and Harry and Watt universities who are you know, building an experiment to test the uh, quantum hypothesis testing as we speak and we're open to further collaborations um, and we actually so before i left sheffield um i actually wrote a grant with peter that was successfully funded so now we have one extra postdoc who is being hired um to do his project um so yeah i will take any questions if there are any Uh, yeah, just a, a bit of a practical question. Um, I was wondering how the input light from two stars are assigned to quantum states. Uh, okay, so I went over this a little bit more quickly. Um, so if you have a single point source, so psi here 
uh, okay, so this has a certain distribution rate. So we can describe this as a Gaussian. Um, and this is more or less a, um, a pure state. So whereas, so yeah, so, yeah, so as opposed to when we have two, um, two different uh, systems, then you have something here um, which corresponds to a, um, a Gaussian that's centered at x, at x zero um, with a weighting factor of one minus epsilon and then this the planet would um, will be slightly displaced by a factor of s and then what you, so 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 these two uh, so if I zoom all the way in here so these two wave functions are actually non-overlapping so um, we will have just have to find a set of bases which diagonalizes um, this density matrix and that we can do relatively relatively easily because there's only two sources. In, in general, this will be a non-trivial problem. Right. Does that answer the okay. question? Yeah, yeah. I thought, okay. I thought that um, they would be correlated with some other quantum states that we create in the lab. Because you, you, you talked oh, about entanglement, so I thought there would be oh, something there. Okay, so okay. Um, so for for the for the lidar problem, then we can we, we send out the signals right that we want uh, that we want to use. But um, if we're looking at light from a distant star, right. uh, there is nothing we can do. So it's just um, thermal light that we can collect. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions, physician, from anyone? I guess not. Then, um, physician, thank you very, very much for that.